<laughs> Achtung, Achtung, which is of course German for Achtung, Achtung. Ah, it didn't seem right to, not to use the original vernacular. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk Live. Um, this is not an April Fool, this is not a prank. The live stream is with us. Hello everyone um, uh, alongside um, uh, the live stream. Hello from Basingstoke, hello from Harefield. People in South Africa, Australia, all over the world. Achtung from Sussex. Glenn Towler says, nice beard. Well, I have to agree with Glenn Towler there. Um, uh, Monty has joined us. He's brought up the peart. We're doing everything we possibly can to keep you entertained. <laughs> um, now, uh, this is like a podcast unlike any other, um, except you can't see the pictures. Um, uh, uh, I hope you're all coping with isolation. It could be worse. You could be in a foxhole in Bastogne holding off an entire German Panzer Division. Or you could be with Johnny Frost. As we can see, James Holland has brought isolation. Essential uh, piece of kit, Alan. <laughs> Essential piece of kit in these troubled times. What everyone needs is a World War II gas mask. And apparently it is, um, it is good for COVID-19. Is it? You just... You just like the rubber. Let's be honest now. <laughs> that lovely, mm, so, oh, so special smell. <laughs> it's not so bad, is it? I mean, you know, with Netflix, walking the dog, listening to a podcast or two, isolation is is tolerable, isn't it? Let, let, let's let's say that, yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, it's absolutely. even better if you're writing a book as well, because that uh, fills the day quite nicely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, now, of course, James is in Wiltshire, um, uh, and you're in the middle of uh, what, uh, Sicily. We're still talking about Sicily, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Still, still very much immersed. I've just been doing the uh, amazing battle for Azoro, yeah. where the Hasty Peas, the Hastings and Prince Edward's um, battalion, managed to clamber up this sort of almost vertical cliff, thousand yeah. foot cliff, in the middle of the night, attack the uh, the Germans from above, and hold wow. on throughout the day. I mean, it's just it's the most amazing action. It's completely impregnable this place, and, and although it had been. Um, a Greek, then a Roman, then a Byzantine, then an Arab, then a Norman strong point. It had never, ever been captured from below, ever. Really? Until the hasty peas got there. Incredible. So the good old Canadians. Incredible. All. Now, Pete Johnston has popped up on our, on our feed says, as a historian and museum professional, please, please do not put on World War II gas masks as they're full of asbestos. <laughs> That's you, Telt. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, yes, I'm putting that back in my... It's proper case, then. <laughs> I'd rather get coronavirus and asbestos in my lungs. Uh, right. So, this is how it's going to work, ladies and gents. On your screen, you'll hopefully see James and me. Sometimes you might even see some photos. But here's the key, key point. We want to hear from you. At the bottom of the screen, it says, ask a question. Um, uh, feel free to do so, um, and we'll answer as many as we can. They'll be filtered to us through the, um, uh, through the, uh, it, it, through our team. Through, through tech, got, through, through tech. Via tech. For our yeah. signal um, I think you're quite right, uh, Catherine. Monty wouldn't have been too happy with that beard. Um, he, he, that was a, one of the few things he would enforce. He didn't like top hats. We don't wear top hats in the Eighth Army, is another thing Montgomery famously said. Um, anyway, <laughs> here's a question. Um, let's get rolling. Um, here's a question to get us started from David Yields. Um, how prominent in battle were the Scottish Pipers, and what did the Germans make of them? Um, so, we've found um, some pictures of Pipers. Um, uh, here we have... Yeah, well, uh, El Alamein, I believe yeah, yeah. this is our first picture. So, James, take us take us through this. Uh, well, the Highlanders, are, you know, traditionally they use the the pipes. I mean, we all we've all heard them. You either sort of love them or hate them, but there is yeah. a sort of mournfulness about them, isn't there? And yeah, and the best descriptions I had was from this guy who was in um, two rifle brigade and also a Maori, a guy called Mike, Mikey Parkinson. He was in yeah. the twenty eighth Maori battalion on the opening night, twenty third of October, nineteen forty two, um, on the opening night of the Second Battle of Alamein. Uh, and they were th and, and he had the Highlanders on um, Mikey had the Highlanders on his right. And he just said it was just the most amazing sound because as they were disappearing over into the, yeah. you know, across uh, the minefields, you could just see faintly in the kind of moonlight and under the flares, these sort of figures of, of, of jocks sort of moving forward, yeah. the 51st Island Division and this amazing sound coming across. And, and he said, you know, I have no idea what effect it had on the enemy. But he said, said, all I can tell you, it was one of the most profoundly moving things I ever heard in my life, ever. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it certainly makes me move if I hear it. I mean, I, yeah. I'll walk, walk quickly past a piper if I possibly can. I mean, that, that <laughs> <laughs> I no. quite like them actually. No, no. I mean, I, 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 th- I mean, I actually think you know, you've, you've got the, you've got the, you, you have got that thing that it announces, it announces that you're coming. That's, I mean, that's what pipes and drums are all about in battle, isn't it? Is it saying in, in the days when they were. So you know, actually present on a battlefield, it's yeah. like we're, here we come, and then the drums would be used to mark, actually um, uh, dictate marching speed and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I yeah. Mean, but but yeah, and then famously, of course, is Bill Millen, um, uh, yeah. whose story often told with Lord Lover, um, who you know, yes, uh, Glenn, I agree, nothing wrong with bag, bag, bagpipes. Glenn Taylor says nothing wrong with bagpipes. Uh, 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 we we're, we're just making mischief. Um, but, yeah, Bill Millen's the uh, um, and we've got a picture of Bill here, I think. It, it, the, the, probably the most famous is. story with Lord, Lord Lovett's commandos landing on the morning of D-Day, playing the pipes in um, in, in his uh, in his landing on craft beach. on sword. And so, and and the story he used to tell was, you know, that that um, you know they was they must have thought I was mad so they didn't kill me. I mean, I I don't know how he knew that. Uh, 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 and after all, considerable luck as to what happened to you coming off coming off a. Um, of a landing craft. Yeah, on, that's true. Uh, I mean, there's a very good statue of him there now as well. Yeah. And I mean, the great thing about Bill Millen is he lived to a ripe old age and he used to yeah. regularly go back and do his pipes and stuff. So he became a bit of a sort of party piece, didn't he? Going up there and doing it. But um, by all accounts, he was a fantastic guy. And, and yeah. I think the bottom line is if, you know, the, the, the pipes are kind of a really important part of those Scottish regiments and, yeah. the, and their, their identity. And it's, it's kind of what they do. And, and obviously, it's a big morale thing. We've talked quite a lot about morale over the last few months, haven't we? And that amazing yeah. book by Jonathan Fennell and stuff. That we've, we've cohesion. Yeah, about cohesion. And, and you know, you hear that stuff. I mean, there's a reason why the ancient Celts used to do their battle cry with their carnixes and all the rest of it. And that's because it does have a profound effect on, yeah. on, the, on the side for which it's being played, yeah. and against the enemy as well. I mean, you don't just do yeah, the marks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, uh, I mean, Andrew great. Andrew Twist says the Australian Six Divisions were singing, were off to see the wizard as they assaulted Bardia. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, and go. uh, and uh, Matthew says, apart from on D-Day, what do the Army Commandos do? Well, you've got the Walker and thing, you've got the Rhine crossing. Um, Army Commandos were kept were kept pretty busy as a sort of... Um, because because the commandos weren't just Royal Marine commandos uh, uh, during during the Second World War, they were um, they were also uh, the, 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 you know they got reduced after the war just to Royal Marine commandos. Was Army commandos uh, did all did lots of amphibious stuff as well, basically. Because yeah, and the fact, the reason they had had navy and um, they had Royal Marine commandos and they had Army commandos is because it was part of combined operations, which was yeah. set up, of course, by um, by yeah. uh, uh, Rear Admiral Mountbatten, Lord Louis Mountbatten at the time. And um, these were kind of an extension of SOE. It's all part of this kind of setting Europe ablaze policy that, that Churchill comes up with in the summer of 1940 during yeah. the Battle of Britain. You know, this idea yeah. of kitting back. Um, and I saw that someone mentioned the auxiliary units just a moment ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, the auxiliary units were, again, an extension of that, of being prepared, being prepared to kind of get dirty, get stuck in, close quarter combat, you know, hand-to-hand fighting, sticking, yeah. sticking commando knives, um, fairbairn knives yeah. into, into kidneys because that's the most... It's so painful if you get stabbed in the kidneys, you just die immediately. Um, <laughs> uh, and actually, I'm just showing you earlier on, Al, um, this rather good... Uh, yeah, yeah. From, um, this is from a genuine uh, battle dress, airborne battle dress of Norman Field. And yeah. Norman was in the Royal Fusiliers, uh, managed to get out, of, um, out of, uh, uh, of Dunkirk, get home, and then he joined up with Peter Fleming and helped set up the auxiliary units. And he yeah. was running an area in Kent, during 1940 and then later joins the airborne and this is what he's wearing when he uh, drops in on um, during operation varsity a little bit of ephemera for you that's very good um eddie o'sullivan says irish brigade battalions also initially went into battle in the tunisian campaign to the sound of pipes force captain murphy and his piper were killed in a counter-attack against german forces on grandstand hill in january 43 eventually it was decided not to attack to the sound of irish pipes that's interesting mm. that that's is interesting because it does announce you it does announce you're coming doesn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, somewhat. Um, yeah, yes, right. But okay. if you've got a massive barrage, yeah. it tends to kind of give the game away as well. I mean, interestingly, <laughs> you know, they were still, a lot of units still wore kilts as well, and they're still using kilts in, in, um, in Sicily, uh, as was Ernst Gunther Bader, um, who was, <laughs> was a, 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 a regimental commander under Rommel in the desert and later was in, um, 
uh, was in Sicily and he was given the job of preparing for and protecting the Straits of Messina. And yeah. there was nothing he liked more than uh, wearing a kilt and a, and a, and a claymore. Oh heavens! Are we talking. Yeah. We're, have we already have we already gone off topic and now we're on eccentric Nazis? Yeah. <laughs> right. We have another question. This is from Craig, nineteen forty. By the way, um, uh, uh, I noticed there's people talking about mics overloading everything. I expect you're. We're all experiencing this slightly differently due to different tech levels as they come, and um, uh, also it's our first go. So give us. You know, basically, this is we're the BEF right now. So if we get this wrong and the whole thing collapses in on itself. Um, uh, we're going to blame the French. Right, hello. Okay, this is from Craig, 1940. Hello, chaps. Love the podcast. With James's new Sicily book coming out and Blair Paddy Main getting looked at with the SRS, do you think he should have got the VC? The paperwork was even signed by Monty and then changed to bar to DSO. A DSO and three bars having met the criteria in different theatres. Was he robbed? Was he denied due to not being able to charm the higher-ups like Sterling could, his history of drinking or brawling? Or was the war the SAS was fighting a new sort of war? Um, I, to, to be perfectly honest, I don't think it's any one of those things. I think when you get a Victoria Cross as, and you get that as opposed to a DSO, I think there's a certain amount of kind of sort of, you know, what the person who's signing off is thinking on that particular morning. Yeah. And, and there's a certain amount of luck to it. I mean, all gongs are, to a certain extent a bit arbitrary because it depends who witnesses them. It depends who puts you in for it and all those yeah. sort of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, four DSOs is pretty good, to be honest. I mean, uh, and the bottom line is, is, you know, everyone was completely awed by Paddy Main. Everyone, mm. everyone. I mean, he couldn't possibly have been held in higher esteem if he'd been given a Victoria Cross. And, and it's not the sort of thing he gave two hoots about, to be perfectly but, honest. But let's be... Um, he was, uh, JMCN has just popped up. Was Maine not a little bonkers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was and now Glenn, man. Glenn, Glenn has joined in where we spoke to, uh, mentioned earlier. Yes, Maine was a bit bonkers. I mean, he, he was. was. Bonkers. He, but, but then lots of people were. I mean, I think you can say Monty was a teeny bit bonkers. But, I mean, well, yes, right. but, but Maine, let, Maine, Maine let off steam by fighting dockers. That was his thing. Challenging yeah. everyone in the bar who was into a fight and, and beating them all up. Well, I mean, it's very interesting. When he, when he, when he wasn't pissed, he was, he was really softly spoken. Uh, and he, he had a big frame. He was a tall guy, Paddy. And he yeah. was one of these people that when he got into a room, you knew it. You yeah. know, he just had that amazing charisma that a handful of people have that when they walk into a room or walk into a gathering, they just feel it. You just yeah. go, whoa, I'm in the presence of someone who's a really big, special character. Mm. Uh, and he just had that. And, and I remember, you know, you, you read accounts of people meeting him for the first time. They said, you know, this huge hulk of a man came in, you know, this reputation before him. And then he opened his mouth and he was really shy and diffident and had a bit of a stutter. Yeah, and, but if you, you could afford to be, you could afford to be a bit shy and diffident if you're, if you're a great well, big hulking, uh, a, a brutal bastard, true. can't you? <laughs> that is true. But, but the kind of Paddy Main, the kind of big growling Paddy Main who goes around kicking ass and wrecking bars in, in, you know, in Cairo mm. and all the rest of it, that character comes to the fore only when he's had an absolute skinful. Um, you know, and it, it seems that he was something of a, a manic depressive i think well yes and he was probably an alcoholic yeah but he was a very very extraordinary man i mean you know all the praise you hear of him is entirely deserved i mean he's uh, one of those kind of super, super but he's men. also one of he's arguably one of those people if the war hadn't come along what would he have done with it, with his youth you know with that with that period of his life he'd have played rugby he'd have been a, he'd have been a barrister and uh, and it's sort of there are people who wore absolutely suits yeah there's, there's there's no there's there's no no better way of putting it i think and yeah. and he is someone uh, and peter fleming is another really good e example and george you know, jellico yeah he was also in the ss and then commands the sbs i mean exactly I'm interviewing him uh, and he was just amazing i mean for him being in the sas being in the sbs it was like being in the boy scouts with guns i yeah. mean he just loved every second of it he loved being in danger he loved shooting people yeah. he loved kind of sort of you know stalking onto Leros in the middle of the night and all that kind of stuff and riding into yeah. a uh, Athens on a bicycle he just couldn't get enough of it I mean he yeah. was the most amazing guy and of course son of the of the famous admiral um and um yeah he, he was the guy who told me that that the reason he didn't join the naval navy was because as, even as a 17 year old yeah. he had the rather unfortunate habit of wetting his bed and he didn't want to piss on the person below if he was in a hammock well, I yeah, I also expect 
it's just plain fucking embarrassing. But there we go. Sorry, I've dropped, I've dropped <laughs> but, the F. But this F, is, but this F is bomb. why he joined the army rather than the uh, rather than the navy. It's now, so brilliant. Tony Tony Stone says, doesn't beating up Dockers affect the operational factor? And I think what mm. t- I think what so, Tony's yeah. I think what Tony's trying to do is get you to say operational factor there, James. I think that's what he's <laughs> well, trying to do. The operational factor, of course, <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> that would go fantastic. Now, um, another I'm question. I'm laughing because every time I laugh, the, the picture shakes. <laughs> that's whoa, that's whoa, 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 the whoa. power of laughter, James. Beautiful. Yeah. Right now, we have a question from Rob Forty Four in Commando Men about a Royal Marine in Northwest Europe. The writer mentions German troops using a mobile brothel in Normandy, close to the front lines. Was this a common practice? Yes, it absolutely yeah. was, and it was really, really well. And um, so, the, the, what the Germans did was they they had these, you know, they had the sort of the hated fell gendarmerie who yeah. had these rather elaborate chains and and sort of. Dog, uh, dog tabs that they put yeah. around their necks. They're absolutely loathed by everyone and they're incredibly strict. And basically, if you want to go to a brothel, what you have to do is you have to go and get checked out by the doctor first. You get handed a French letter. Um, you get told, you know, what you can do and what you can't do. You hand over your, your, your cash, your Yeah. Um, you get given a docket and off you go and do your business. And then when you come back, you have to be checked again. And if yeah. you don't do that, then, you know, you literally can be shot. But that's actually... Not really particularly different to what the British Army did, but uh, I mean, apart from the being shot bit at the end, right? Is that is that the British Army really did make sure that its men's sexual health was um, uh, uh, was looked after? And of course, there's the I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've talked about this before the podcast in, in 1940 uh, or late 39, I think, when Montgomery gets into trouble with with sort of polite society because he he writes a, a memo about horizontal refreshment and says uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and says uh, you know. Um, that if the men the men need to do this, they're going to do this. So what we need to do is keep tabs on it, and we need to we need to um, they need to be approved brothels and all this sort of stuff. And he got into all sorts of trouble. And nearly, I mean, nearly, you know, another one of those occasions where he nearly lost his job for telling the truth. And that uh, um, it's really it, it it you know Stan Lee. I don't know if people know that. People probably know this. Stan Lee, he, he invented the Incredible Hulk, Fantastic Four, yep. Spider Man. In the war, he worked for um, uh, American, uh, you know, because he wanted to be a writer. He ended up in the army as a GI, writing um, uh, uh, VD propaganda. No um, way! Yeah, yeah, I never that, knew that. Yeah, yeah, that's what that was. One of his first professional writing jobs was he wrote about. He wrote all those sort of, you know, um, all those kind of. Uh, yeah. Don't don't get VD, whatever you do, and 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 and, and that didn't just that wasn't that was also. You know, be careful of the easy. I mean, be careful of the easy um, uh, ladies of easy virtue. You know, like watch yourself and all that. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's very much of its time. But yeah. but he was involved in that incredibly, and was was yeah. part of the army education drive to try and make sure that so because you know a man a sick man uh, a man off with with um uh, is no use to any man. Yeah, yeah. He's exactly. Not used to a fighting army. Exactly. Fighting He's lost to the enemy and all that. Yeah, but, that yeah, syphilis yeah. was another enemy. And 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 it's it, it, you know that the, the obvious. This obviously was a thing the army really really had to keep um, uh, uh, tabs on. So because because I remember talking. You know, you read accounts of Normandy queues at brothels, especially after the Great Swan when they've broken out queues yeah, yeah. of queues at brothels at Antwerp. You know, um, uh, great lot because because but, of course by the time. By the time you get to, um, by the time Antwerp's been captured and the sort of front stabilises after Market Garden, basically, you do get, you know, Antwerp turns into this enormous furlough place where people, um, uh, you know, get their time off yeah. and come back and, and there's, you know, there's a sort of, there's a sort of civilised rear area that hasn't been smashed up like Normandy. And you get, you get people, you know, great long queues at brothels and it becomes yep. part of the sort of, becomes part of what you do on your, on your on your time out yeah i remember my great friend bill who was uh who lived in um uh, charleston and was uh, in the u.s yeah. marine corps yeah he'd been on okinawa and him and his mates after okinawa they were put on um they were sent to shanghai and um for some downtime yeah and um basically they just sort of you know hoard their way through the city yeah yeah. Um, and um, and sort of you know got all that pent up aggression, emotion, all the rest of it out of it. I mean, it's sort of it's it's it sounds so barbaric and awful, but yeah. if you've just been through the bloodiest battle of all in the Second World War, yeah, I guess that's what you need to do. And interestingly, he then eventually got back home um, and bought a Harley and went off on a one month driving trip 
all around America, came back home, told his parents absolutely anything. And he said, you know, I didn't spare them any details at all. And he said, and I've never had any nightmares. And That's of course, very interesting. You know, talking to he, he's, a unique, he's a unique case, but he, he was very much an advocate of it's much better to, yeah. it's good to talk. So, um, Pete, um, Peter Johnston, again, says VD was a huge <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter Johnston says uh, VD was a huge problem for the British in post war Germany, or, and despite the non fraternisation rule. Well, we all know how well the non fraternisation rule panned out. And yeah. then Mick says VD was a, still a problem for the British Army in Germany in 1984. Smiley face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a smiley face? It is a smiley face. You'd have thought you'd be having one of those faces with tears coming out. And then, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Philip Trousdall says, when I was an officer cadet at Sandhurst, we were told that only generals and chaplains could catch VD from loose seats. That's very, very, very good. Okay. <laughs> now, um, so, uh, questions. Some questions that are coming in as we go. Um, uh, insert generic well done. This is from Adam. Uh, Alan James, we often say necessity is the mother of invention. Um, with that in mind, which nation during the Second World War proved to be the most innovative in solving the challenges they came across? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's probably not going to be any great surprise <laughs> when I say it was definitely the Allies. I, I, I think it's not just about innovation. I think the point about innovation is it's not just coming up with innovation for innovation's sake. It's yeah. coming up with the right innovation. And I think the two things go hand in hand. And I think you know, obviously, the Germans being the first people to send a man-made object into outer space yeah. is, you know, that's quite innovative, yeah. I think, by anyone's reckoning. You know, no one can doubt that. You know, cre creating the ME-163 comet, cre you know, getting, getting the ME-262 in the air for the first, you know, yeah. as an operational aircraft for the first time, creating the Type 21 U-boat, um, yeah. which is the benchmark for all future post-war submarines and is yeah. the world's first proper submarine as opposed yeah. to a submersible which is what most allied submarines are in the second world war you know all of that is a pretty pretty amazing but how useful was it and and did they do it at the right time and the answer would have to be no whereas yeah. what you see from the british and the americans particularly is their 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 focus is just so good and i think yeah. that's the difference and i was single out um as one thing I, the cavity magnetron i think is one of the greatest inventions yeah. that emerged out of the second world war which i think is invented in november 1940 and it's what enables you to reduce the size of your radar aerial so instead of having a 270 foot high lattice work aerial uh, on the yeah. coast at dover or ventnor or wherever it might be um actually it's so small you can put it on a destroyer or a corvette or inside a wellington or a, yeah. or a, a very long range um b24 liberator and that is quite a big game changer because it means you don't have to have all those sort of tv aerials that the germans have later on in the war um on the front causing drag and all the rest of it um and also the other thing is is that the germans never know that we've invented it ever during the second yeah. world war so it's a huge huge advantage but there's so many different things well i'm going to pick one i'm going to pick something incredible mundane right because yeah, people suggesting synthetic fuel ejector seats so on plastic armor right yep Invented by a solicitor, a guy called Edward Terrell, who was a, like a, a bloke, who, a gentleman inventor. And what he what he realised is if you put if you put bitumen, um, uh, it, it, basically it, it, he invents this thing that that can be that can be um, applied to ships that reduces the shock of uh, bullets and stuff. And he if he sees that ships have been patched, he sees this paddle st steamer that's been patched with a combination of bitumen with cork in it. Right, right, um, and that the, 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 it's a highly flexible um, uh, material, and and so he, he he goes to the government and he pit, he pitches this idea, and they and they and it doesn't work. The the uh, and someone says, well, hang on a minute, if we fill this with bitumen, if we fill this with with stone, basically, yeah. well, then we can invent a flexible, applicable um, surface to ships that um, that works as armour rather than steel, and of course because of because because the economy has, has had to shift its emphasis, um, they're not building roads, so there's right. loads of asphalt, there's loads of bitumen. And so right. you're, you're able to then create this plastic um, uh, armour stuff that yep. goes on ships that, um, that's, that this innovate, and, and, and it's not glamorous. I mean, I think, I think this is what's interesting because a lot of these innovations aren't glamorous. They aren't DD tanks, they aren't the Mulberry and, and so on. But it's it's a it's a it's a really 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 interesting um, uh, 
idea. And there's there's all that going on at the yeah, same I time. And, and, and the British genius, are very receptive. The British are very very receptive to this stuff. And I, I and I and I absolutely know that you know the the, the headline things are the uh, 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 tanks and uh, I mean you know Andrew Twist pops up with penicillin. Absolutely. Yeah 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 absolutely. Well and pikeet not so good, so much, but you know it's a good idea at the time. But, yeah. um, but but penicillin, absolutely. You know, Alexander Fleming, that. I mean, again, the Germans never have that. You know, the yeah. Soviet Union never has that. Yeah. The Japanese never have that. It's, yeah. it's such a game changer. You know, and by 1944 on the battlefield, you know, one in four casualties that are getting to hospital are getting returned to the battlefront. Yeah. And that is, you know, really, it's, it is all about welfare and morale, but it's also about pragmatism as well. And I think that yeah. generally speaking, the, 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 the Western allies particularly are just so much more efficient at fighting wars, which is one of the reasons why at the end of the war, the number of dead um, in, uh, of Americans, Canadians and British and so on yeah. is considerably less than all the other major combatants, even though they've been, uh, they've been involved in the war in sort of every corner of the globe. Yeah. That's not because we haven't been trying. It's because we fought a much more efficient war. Yeah. yeah and yeah, that yeah, goes yeah. all the way back to those points about invention yeah. and all yeah. the rest of it. OK. Um, uh, from Pete. Um, loves the podcast. Um, Thanks, Pete. <laughs> um, your knowledge and enthusiasm of your subjects is a real tonic in these troubled times. I, I should say oh. so. It's given me stuff to read about. Um, my <laughs> question is, did the Germans have any successes in cracking the Allied codes in the way that Bletchley Park did? I've read that the French encryption was pretty easy to break, but I haven't heard about Axis powers breaking into British or American ciphers. Yeah, they did, and notoriously yeah. so in, the, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, in North Africa. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did. They had lots of codes, and the Japanese broke lots of American codes as well, and, and British codes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was happening all the time. But 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 uh, we were more canny with our with our coding. We had uh, more foolproof um, encryption um, devices, um, and uh, yeah, they didn't. Uh, but in the, nothing nothing like on the same level that we. I were mean, tracking. I mean, in the desert, one of the big pro well, in the desert, one of the big problems is, is was that the um, uh, that the uh, American military attaché. <laughs> Was was uh, he? He'd been he'd been uh, cracked, hadn't he? And was yes, basically exactly. reporting back to Washington, going, "Oh, they're going to do this next." And they get, you know, there's this yep. big push coming, and blah blah blah. And the and the Germans knew all, basically knew all about things like yeah, Crusader. Yeah, I remember and, rightly, they were overrun at uh, Alam Halfa, weren't they, at the very end of August? Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why um, the Germans are so in the, you know, the, the Germans and the Italians are so in the dark about Alamein. But yeah. obviously. You know, they knew what was going on. I mean, it's all that other stuff, isn't it? All those deception things about sort of, you know, Masculine, the magician who did all that kind of sort of smoke yeah. and mirrors stuff. You know, I'm, I, you know I'm, not, I'm just not that convinced by all, by all that stuff, I've got to say. <laughs> you know, okay. I, I, I think the Germans knew they were coming and, and sort of pretty much what they were going to do. Yeah, um, yeah. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, uh, from Andy H. My nan used to swear blind that she was pushing her mum in her pram in 1939 in Liverpool. A lone German plane flew overhead and the pilot waved to her. Could that have happened? She also claimed to have invented hockey, so I've always taken that claim with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Don't think so. Don't Not think 1939. so. 1939. Uh, 1940, yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, it wouldn't have been a fighter plane because they wouldn't have been able to reach there. So it had to have been a bomber. Lone bomber coming over could have been a reconnaissance plane. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Okay. So All I've right. got you know. So there's a guy in my village. who absolutely swears blind. Swears blind that um, the Graf Zeppelin flew down um, the Chalk Valley in 1939. Really? Yeah, the summer of 1939. Now, what did happen was... Well, they uh, sent they, Zeppelins out to test the radar, didn't they? To, to, they look, did. at, to look at the RDF and, then and then figure out... they flew back again. Now, is it possible that they could have flown back inland and flown back out over Southampton? Well, is it possible they got lost? Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> so, so it is all possible. It's just... Uh, you know, he says, I can remember it. He said, I looked up and I heard this amazing kind of sort of faint whirring and I could see it and, and it was coming all the way from Salisbury. And I looked at it and watched it as it flew directly over the village. I mean, it was so vivid, his memory. You can't possibly kind of see how he could have been mistaken in that. But, you know, memory is a weird thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, or it was the R1, it was, you know, one of the R, R100 no, or something. No, because that was, that was the, I mean, the R100 blew up in... It's the one, R101 blew up in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I wanted one that blew up on its way. Oh yes, 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 yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. Because because I I I grew up around Bedford where there's these enormous Cardington um, hangars that were built for the R101 that are just oh, yeah, like they're enormous, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, which is just, just, just by, um, so gigantic. Yeah, sorry. By Wallace. Yeah, yeah, of course. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, um, uh, where they, they made the Batman films in there. Anyway, we've gone, we're really off subject now. We're going to talk about <laughs> Batman films. Um, uh, um, yes, now, um, we have another question, and uh, we're going to get stuck into this, I expect. Um, this is from Russell, Ch Russell Chapman. What's the single most important order? Yes, it did crash in France, I know, yes. Was the, um, Glenn, um, from, was the single most important order in the Second World War, the infamous halt order of 24th May, oh, 1940? God, if so, <laughs> can you once and for all assign responsibility for it to Hitler or von Rundstedt or even Goering? Cheers, lads, loving the pod, especially the brilliant book recommendations. Uh, yes, I think I can assign it to Hitler. Okay, so there's all sorts of ghastly theories about this so, so basically what happens is I'm, I'm okay i'm gonna might get my dates muddled up but so give me a, a day yeah. or two's grace yeah but i think what happens is it's on the 23rd of may 1940 and the panzers panzer group a uh, army group a the panzers panzer group kleist which is under guderian yeah. yeah have surged forward rommel is surging forward as well and they have this opportunity to completely encircle the bef and the french that are in the northern pocket yeah and what happens, but, but, but von Kleist is very nervous that his panzers have got ahead of his infantry. And so he orders a halt to the panzers. So it's just half far and let everyone else catch up. And Guderian and everyone so comes back and goes, are you mad? This is insane yeah. because we have got this opportunity to completely encircle the whole northern pocket of the French and British. Uh, uh, we need to push on. He goes, no, 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 no. And Guderian, um, and von um, Wunschner, rather, who yeah. is the commander of Army Group A, confirms von Kleist's order. Yeah. When this is relayed up to army headquarters, up to, uh, up to Franz Halder, who is the chief of staff of the army, yeah. he, um, uh, and von Braukic, who is the commander of the army, he realizes that this is absolutely insane. And so makes a decision to hand the um, panzers, panzer group Kleist, over to the authority of Army Group B, which is attacking from the north. Yes. And says, right, instead of the Panzers now being the uh, being the Hamel and uh, Panzer, uh, an Army Group B being the Anvil, we will mm -hmm. turn it around. So Army Group A can be the, can be the Anvil and, and pa uh, Army Group B can be yeah. the Hammer. Yeah. And we can continue and complete this encirclement. Yeah. The following day, the 24th of May, Hitler visits uh, uh, von Rundstedt and says, What's going on? How are the Panzers? And von Rundstedt goes, well, my fear, I don't know, because the, um, the Panzers have been handed over to Army Group B. And the Fuhrer goes absolutely apeshit and goes, what? You know, how dare they do this? You know, how can they, that, something of that magnitude be agreed without consulting me first? Blah, 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 yeah. blah. Lots of spittle, lots of bad breath, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes straight back to, to von Braukic, straight back to Holder, says, says, don't you dare do something like that again hands the panzer straight back to army group a and von Rundstedt upholds the halt order and yeah and hitler says it's now von Rundstedt's decision as to when he undoes that halt order yeah, and says yeah. that they can move again so everything's back to as it was and in that interregnum because they don't get the order to release until i think it is the 27th of may and they're not on the move again until the morning of the 28th Operation Dynamo has started, the evacuation of the BEF, yeah. and they've been able to get it out. Ever since they get the BEF out, and, and the encirclement never happens, which is yeah. why we have Dunkirk and the, all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is a really major cock-up from the point of the, of the, uh, from the Germans. And, you know, it's dangerous doing what-ifs, but you can't see really how they could have failed to do that complete encirclement. Yeah. Had... Holder had his way and had Guderian had their way. Yeah. There's but been lots of conspiracies. There's been lots and lots of conspiracies. In, in the meantime, um, Goering, who is have, hovering over Hitler's shoulders, goes, goes, oh, don't worry about it, my Fuhrer. My, my, my Luftwaffe can deal with these guys yeah. anyway, these hopeless RAF and, and yeah. the, the pathetic BEF. Uh, and Hitler goes, great, well, time to crack on then. Um, and of course they don't because they're not able to. But, but there is this theory that... that you know, Hitler was doing it because he sort of wanted Britain to get away and all yeah, that sort yeah. of nonsense. It's nothing to do with that at all. It yeah. is purely 100% about Hitler showing who is the daddy man and showing yeah. um, the army command that they can't basically kind of muck around with him. Uh, yeah. And everything has to go through him. He is but, the, the absolute... But, but so much of this is born of the fact that they, no one expected any of it to work. No. They were in a situation they never right. actually imagined would 
come off. No. The, the, in fact, they did, far exceeded their expectations with Falgal. The, 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 the whole thing, and you know, that the, basically the Allies had delivered the victory to the to the to the Germans by doing everything that was everything that was asked of them. Really, if we're, yeah. it, 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 And and so so then what happens is is they have to start making decisions, having because they've made all their decisions, haven't they? So they're suddenly having to start making decisions, and then you get into actually who's in charge, who's boss. And of course, if you've got Hitler in the mix, it, it, he's boss, isn't he? And yeah. and and he wants also he wants to he wants to claim this victory for himself rather than say the generals are responsible. Yes. So he's trying he's he's trying to lay down the law and say this is um this is this is who's in charge here. The other thing but, is, but, is but, well, uh, also but, but also you're two weeks into the campaign, everyone's exhausted, the gears falling, the tanks are beginning to fall apart. Um, ammunition is an enormous issue um, uh, in the, you know, because the, because at the start of the First World War, the Germans nearly ran out of ammunition. So, uh, and there was an ammunition scandal during the First World War. It was an issue that that everyone remembered and hung heavy in people's minds mm. in terms of in terms of procurement. And so, you've got that whole thing of a big part of the steel <clears throat> effort that's supposed to go to U-boats, supposed to go to tanks, supposed to go to the J88. That actually is being the steel's being spent on ammunition. Yeah, and they're worried that, that you know they're worried that stock stocks are going to run out, and you've got you've got all this this because it's supposed to be a short war. The plan is the plan is for a short knockout blow. Then it works. They they're caught in the you know the army itself is sort of caught out by its own success, and then the polit and then of course the politicians get involved. We go well actually I'm in charge here, not Halder, not not uh, von Rundstedt, not anyone else. And Hitler steps in and 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 makes the decision for everybody, and and of course. He made he, he he was he he was quite capable of making terrible decisions. Hitler, I think we, you know, that, that's well, pretty well established. Well, I think this is the point. This is what one has to understand. Is, is you know, I remember I remember writing this book once, uh, uh, and uh, someone reviewed it and says, you know, how dare Holland say that you know Hitler was a was a military nincompoop because you know did he not realise that you know Hitler voraciously studied military history and read his history and all the rest of it? And I thought, well, what a stupid thing to say. I mean, you know, I've studied history, but obviously, you know, I'd be absolutely crap as a field marshal or commander of an army, I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, and, you know, so the things don't go, go give a call. And the point about Hitler is, you know, he really was just a half-jack in the First World War. He never yeah. went to staff college. Yeah, he read a few books and stuff. But also, by 1940, you know, he, he's, he starts to become convinced of his own brilliance and genius because he's mm. surrounded by sycophants who sort of go, yes, mein Fuhrer, you're the best, mein Fuhrer. You know, can I, you know, do yeah. unspeakable things to you, on mein Fuhrer? Uh, and... and, and you know, he started to believe it. But but the truth is, he is totally ill-equipped and untrained in every regard to be making these sort of decisions. Yeah. And the fact that he's making a decision of that magnitude, purely out of spite and to show who is the daddy man, uh, um, to sort of get one over the army high command, just goes to show what a kind of woeful and inadequate person he is as an army commander. Which book would you recommend on this? It's the Freiser, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yes, Karl Heinz Freiser. Uh, yeah. Freezer, I think it is. Freezer. F R I E S E R. Yeah. Karl Heinz Freezer, and he's an ex uh, um, German army colonel um, and very pronounced uh, um, historian. And he wrote a book called Blitz krieg legend and he goes into this in very very great detail and it's impossible to disagree with anything he says to be perfectly yeah. honest i mean he's yeah. absolutely nailed it once and for all uh, and you know all those other conspiracy theory nonsense ideas are just need to be kicked into touch yeah. okay um uh, just uh, just on our sidebar Hydor says an old boy i know was part of operation vastly which is which uh, 75 years ago it just kind of happened um, uh, eight, yeah, 75 years ago, it just kind of happened. Um, and remember standing on the banks of the Rhine and hearing the hell of a racket as an ME262 flew over the course of the, along the course of the river. It was belching black smoke, presumably because of the poor fuel it was burning. He said it sounded like a badly tuned bus. Well, it might have been hit by a hawker tempest. I mean, you know. <laughs> talking of tempest, I just want to mention um, the uh, Hawker Typhoon Preservation Group because it oh, is yeah. the 75th yeah. anniversary today of the shooting down of RB396, which is this uh, um, typhoon which is being restored currently uh, somewhere yep. in Sussex, uh, down at Goodwood. And uh, they're an amazing bunch of people that are putting this together. And yep. on the 1st of April, 1945, um, uh, Flight Lieutenant Chris House was flying this particular typhoon uh, and attacking a kind of German column on the ground. 
um, and got hit by some light flak and had to crash land. And yeah. he was safe, he was fine, and he survived the war and all the rest of it. But the, uh, but the typhoon had to be abandoned. Um, it later got picked up and got put in a, in a museum in Holland, and it was then bought in 2012. And ever since then, they've been restoring it bit by bit, painstaking um, effort. Yeah. But as you know, Al, I'm a massive fan of the typhoon and the tempest. And mm. I would just so love to see a typhoon flying again. I really, really would. It would just be the most amazing thing. And they've got a, um, a Napier Sabre engine in absolutely perfect condition. It's good to go. They've run it up, all the rest of it. It's all absolutely fine. Um, and it will happen, but they, they need lots of support. So if anyone wants to get involved with that, if you look up just the Hawker Typhoon Preservation Group, you'll find it on Facebook. You'll find there's a web page and all the rest of it. Yeah. That's 75 years ago today. So. And, it, and, of course, um, as Sterrett and someone else earlier pointed out, it's the RAF's birthday today, of course. Yes, it is. Yeah, formed on April Fool's Day. Um, yeah, uh, 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 let's not get into the fact it was uh, formed on April Fool's Day. Right. Okay. Um, uh, now, Dauntless says. Now, this is. Here we go. <coughs> um, uh, as we know, Allied tankers say they feared the Tiger tank, but what Allied tank did the Axis fear most? Sherman Firefly question mark bog standard Sherman due to weighted numbers. As for British tanks, what were the winners and losers? Thanks in advance. Oh my God! How long have we got? I see. Al, this is a perfect opportunity to show some of your models. Oh yeah, yeah. Hold okay, the line, corner. It's got the most amazing collection of tank models. I, I hadn't realised what a closet modeler he was, but I've got to say, he's pretty darn good at them. Check out this bad boy, M10 Achilles. Look at that. Whoa. I'll just move Monty out of the way. There we go. Look at that. I mean, look at the detail on that. There we are. You're a proper tank modeler nerd. It's Seventeen fantastic. pounder. You, Look really, at that. Got, you really have inspired me. I'm, mm. I, I, honestly, when I've got this this bloody book done, uh, <laughs> that is what I'm going to do. My <laughs> self isolation holiday treat is going to be creating a um, definitely. It's got to be Sherman, hasn't it? But I'm yeah. going to say, in terms of the ones they most fit, I reckon. I mean, from all the all the kind of literature I've read on, on um, you know, and listened to um, German accounts and all the rest yeah. of it, boy, they did not like the crocodile. Yeah. And who can blame them? Something yeah. that can fire. A jet of uh, 120 yards of napalm. I mean, well, no well, thank and, you. and uh, oh, yes, Gareth says it's not a tank. Um, yes, I know it's, it's a tank destroyer. A tank. It's a okay. tank destroyer. Okay. Right, what, but, but, what else okay, is you know, there? Let, let's see what else is in the tank. Can see you flame. <laughs> okay, so I'm calling it a tank for the purposes of this discussion. What have you got now? <laughs> Sorry, James. I could. It's, what have you got there now? we go. What's that? Yeah. yeah, it's an archer, which is a Valentine chassis with a seventeen pounder, and it and the gun points backwards. So you fire the thing, and then you and then you you depart the scene of the crime, which I think oh, is pretty clever. Good, yeah. Yeah. So I've got to. Um, I've just been writing about Hummels, ah. and assault guns, one hundred and fifty-five millimeter assault yeah. gun howitzers. Yeah. Well, he talks about. He says it's a heavy, a heavy assault gun howitzer. Yeah, is what he calls it. He says, yeah. I, I, I mean, a, in, a, in, in the 3rd Battalion of the Hermann Goering Panzer Regiment, yeah. um, and I am in the Heavy Assault Gun Platoon, I think he calls it. Mm. Well, it's an abteiling, isn't it? But it's not a battalion. He's just in that particular bit. But anyway, but I, I can't see that in July 1943 it could have been anything other than a Hummel. Mm. A bumblebee. Yeah. Soft yeah. name for a... Yeah, soft name for a nasty thing. But, but, he's, but certainly, he's certainly on a hill firing out to sea, so it's got to be something that can lob a shell a fair old distance. I don't think 105 would be able to chuck it that far, would it? Terry says, why did it take us so long to put sloping armour on our British tanks? Um, well, hmm. <sighs> because um, uh, we didn't think we it was the... the Right, solution to the problem. Um, you, you have, you have, you know, you, you, you have these two philosophies. You have the infantry tank, so um, uh, uh, like, so which is, you know, which is the Churchill, and uh, super thick armour, slow, brick built like a brick outhouse, can go, can go up very steep hills. Um, an infantry support tank, an integrated infantry weapon, and then you have the, the, the cruiser tank philosophy, which, uh, and of course, what happens at the end of the war is you end up, they give up on that altogether, and you get, you get basically the precursor to the main, the main battle tank. Um, but the... Yeah, I, I, think, I think the whole sloping armour is a little bit of a kind of sort of, is a tiny bit misleading, to be perfectly honest, because, you know, you only have sloping armour really on the front, and... and so much of a tank's time, they're not on the, they're not kind of facing no. straightly down the barrel of the person that's trying to shoot them. 
No. Uh, uh, you know, that's how they get destroyed. You know, so uh, there are inherent problems with sloping armour of the kind of design of the hull. I mean, obviously yeah. it works for Sherman and it works for works for Panther and, and, yeah. and so on. Um, but but that's it's very not, good. It's not, but it's not the kind of it's, it's not that is the solution to, to yeah. your your armour issue. Yeah. There yeah. are other, well, other ways. To but do also, it. most armoured. I mean, here's the thing: most armoured encounters in Normandy were um, were uh, very close. Um, you'd, you'd get, you'd go round a corner. There'd be a self-propelled gun there. It'd, it'd fire one off at you and then vanish to to a, to a pre-arranged second firing position. Blah 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 blah. And the and the the, the big the big open the big open encounters like say Goodwood are, are, are not the norm. Uh, uh, um, yeah. uh, 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 that's a. I mean, the reason Goodwood is such a magnet it, for, for controversy. I think a discussion is because it's 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 not what's going on in Normandy in general. It's not normal. It's not normal. I mean, the, the Goodwood is not normal to have those two armored divisions sort of operating side by side. That's yeah. not how they do things, and they're doing it to try and save save infantry because yeah. they're but, running short of infantry. But actually, yeah. it doesn't doesn't has the complete opposite effect because actually yeah. you still got lots of infantry involved in the battle and lots of get become casualties. David so Yields says but, David Yields says sloping armor compromises internal crew space. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well that's my point. There's you know there's 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 always there's always kind of arguments for both both sides. Yeah. Right. Well I think you know what? I think we've that's about all we've got time for. Um you know, oh, yeah, that's gone, gone really, really. It's flown by, it? and and I've 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 enjoyed enormously watching yeah, everyone chipping it's in along great. the side. It's been yeah. absolutely fantastic to hear from you all. Um, the well, church and Avery. We haven't answered more of those questions. Yeah, that's right. The flying come dustbin, come Glenn. Absolutely, the flying flying dustbin is spigot mortar. A relation, <laughs> yeah. of course, a relation of the peat. There uh, we this, are. <laughs> and there's one of those Churchill tanks with the uh, with the huge dustbin mortar. Um, just outside uh, from Juno Beach. Yeah. Uh, on the way. Yeah, yeah. Juno, no. And it's been painted a horrible colour. It's been and they've painted got, a completely wrong green. And I think they've got one in the in the restoration shed at um, Bovington as well. And, uh, and Avery, yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they have. They yeah. absolutely have that amazing shed. Wow. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, there, once it, everything opens up, anyway, you get your that's, right that's all we've got time for. Um, remember, you can hear a chapter of the day of the brilliantly vivid novel, The Cauldron, written by Zeno, based yeah. on his actual experiences at the Battle of Arnhem. Um, yeah. This is the book we've been reading from. Here's the cover. Um, although it has several covers. Um, uh, here it comes, hopefully. There we go. Yep. Super I've rare. Trying, I've been trying to show up other covers on uh, on Twitter, but yeah, it's a it's the most yeah. fantastic book. And I've got to say, Al, what I've heard of you of your readings, you do it damn well. Do you do oh, it thanks justice? very thanks very much, James. That's oh, very oh, very, yeah. that's very sweet small. of you. Um, <laughs> and of course. Um, uh, Z who was Zeno? Um, this is a this is a this is a good question. Uh, um, he was called uh, Gerald Lamarck, and uh, he was uh, a lifelong um, uh, criminal, basically con man, and ended up in wormwood scrubs for murdering his wife's lover in a hotel in Swansea, and was taught to write by George Blake, the traitor, who then escaped from wormwood scrubs or jumping over the wall and landing in a lorry with a mattress. Um, uh, and uh, um, Oh, my, that's my front door. I've obviously, I'm obviously out of time. That's my doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really anyway. to go. anyway, it's time to go. Thanks, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for watching. If you were watching, um, it's been our absolute pleasure. We have ways of making you talk. Auf Wiedersehen. Cheerio. Juicy cheers.